parents and got vaccinated against their will will testify in front of Congress about his decision. Ethan Lindenberger announced on YouTube that he will appear alongside health experts and openly fact-checked his parents' anti-vaccine theories. The now 18-year-old had never had a vaccine until he went to the Ohio Department of Health in December to receive a series of standard vaccinations. This hearing comes as yet another study confirms the vaccine for measles, mumps, and rubella does not increase the risk of autism, nor does it trigger autism in children who are at risk. This is a study that looked at more than 650,000 children. Ethan joins us now from Washington this morning. Ethan, uh, you are brave. Thank you for doing this, and thank you for being here this morning. I'm glad I get to share my story, and I'm glad to, um, I get to talk to you guys. I'm really excited. What are you going to tell Congress today? I'm just going to share my story, talk about the importance of accurate information and the dangers of misinformation, and how that applies to my life. To walk us through what had to be a difficult decision for you. In effect, challenge challenging your parents. You know, this started with a Reddit posting. You said in that, uh, my parents are kind of stupid, don't believe in vaccines. But I should also note, and you've said this repeatedly, that you, you love your parents. Uh, you question their judgment on this, not their care. Tell us how you've, how you've balanced that and, and how they've reacted to this. Yeah, so, I mean, Obviously, you have to find some footing, and so for my parents, uh, we had communicated as the story started to progress, and I just affirmed that I would be as respectful and, and kind as I could with being true to the situation. And so I publicly have said that my mom is misinformed and that she's incorrect, but never have I really once gone on, on air or um, on television and said, you know, that she's dumb or stupid or she hates her family because that's not the case. Mm. Yeah, I know you yeah. love her, your parents dearly, and they love you dearly, mm -hmm. uh, but, but you really dis disagree on this. You've taken action. You're protecting yourself with these vaccines, but you have four siblings, right? You're one of five children. Mm -hmm. So yeah, have, you, have you convinced your parents for your siblings? No, no. And even what you said about how I'm protecting my own health and safety, I mean, my decisions stem from that, but also the health and safety of other people. Yeah. And so for my siblings, of course, I mean, they not having their vaccinations are at higher risk, but other people in a similar situation or that can't get vaccines or that are extremely young. And so that's kind of where my decisions stemmed out of. And so far, none of that has really resonated with my mother. Hmm. This is a serious issue. It's become a national issue. Measles, which was eradicated in this country, is back. There, there are yeah. dozens of people, uh, young people, who have measles again. And I, and I know this is a difficult question for you because anti-vaxxers are, at least in part, to, to, blame, to blame for this. I, I wonder if you, and again, tough question, but I wonder, do you blame your parents, in part, for this coming back again? This potentially deadly disease coming back again? So that's a great question, and I would say I wouldn't blame them specifically. I would more blame the information that's been, been given to them. Uh -huh. um, because when you're looking at the sources that spread this information, the, these lies, for lack of a really better more, or more accurate term, um, it's very clear that all the information is, is incorrect, skewed data, um, everything is not cited. And also there's a lot of emotional appeals talking about families and children and appealing to a parent's love and almost manipulating that to convince them that vaccines are dangerous, which that's the issue I take. And yeah. I've tried to convey to my parents that I don't think that they are stupid for believing that, but that people are very convincing and that's very dangerous. Yeah. Look, yeah. Jim and I think about this, we talk about this a mm -hmm. lot, even off the air, we both have young, young children and you know, ju just reading this and now hearing your firsthand account uh, is very powerful. What about the laws and the regulations? whether it comes to social media posts um, with anti-vaxxers and fake news, whether it comes to actual laws that you think should be changed in you know, nearly 20 states where parents have this choice, what do you want to see? So in terms of legislation, uh, it's a complicated issue because you have uh, both the state laws regarding exemption uh, mm -hmm. from vaccinations for public school on personal and religious grounds, and for the social media platforms where a lot of this misinformation spreads, um, it's a private company that can do it at once with, with its platform. And so it's really up to the public to pressure and push these companies to take action. And you're seeing that already um, with some companies like Pinterest and I think some others were also taking some, some actions and changes. But 
Uh, I don't think that there's necessarily clear answers so far that I've seen, but I definitely think that that's the root of a lot of these problems. Yeah, and still no federal law requiring right. this. Listen, yes, Ethan, yes. thanks so much for joining the show. You're, you're doing you. your country a service today. We appreciate it. Hope to stay in touch. Good luck. Thanks, Ethan. Really fascinating. He's going before Congress in just a few minutes. All right, an American doctor's family says he is being beaten and tortured inside a jail in Saudi Arabia. So what is the United States doing about it next? A Harvard-educated doctor and dual citizen of the U.S. and Saudi Arabia is being held there without charges by the Saudis. And his family believes that Saudi authorities are beating him and torturing him. Dr. Walid Fatahi, pictured there, was detained along with other prominent Saudis in November 2017 by the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And this morning, the Washington Post is reporting that the doctor, quote, was reportedly grabbed from his room at the Ritz-Carlton, slapped, blindfolded, stripped to his underwear, bound to a chair, shocked with electricity, and whipped so severely that he could not sleep on his back for days. This is new reporting from the Washington Post, which I should note is also the former employer of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, whose brutal murder the CIA says was ordered by uh, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Joining us now is our Nick Robertson. For more. Look, I mean, a few days ago when, when Jake Tapper asked John Bolton about this, he essentially said, look, there's consular access, but I don't know much more at this point, and this is an American citizen. And it appears that consular access only started recently, and you raised uh, the, the name of Jamal Khashoggi. Well, Jamal Khashoggi, right around that time that uh, Dr. Fatahi was being held and beaten, as we understand, a source of mine who's familiar with the subject, um, it confirms what the family's been telling us, that he was beaten while he was there um, at that hotel. Uh, that, that at the time that that was happening, uh, Jamal Khashoggi tweeted about this, saying, what's happening? How can this be happening to Dr. W Waleed Fatahi, you know, to a man like this. We can't get any straight answers. The, pro the uh, prosecutor general won't give straight answers. What is happening? So the flag has been raised, if you will, you know, uh, over a year ago. So the consular access that is getting now um, seems to be after this long period in detention. And what his lawyer says is happening is that, uh, that every day he's sort of under this psychological duress because he doesn't know what's going to happen. And his family his, his family say that his mental condition uh, is deteriorating in jail because he's he's afraid for what's going to happen to him next. With no consequences for the Khashoggi murder, at least so far, a U.S. arms deal is proceeding uh, to Saudi Arabia. You cover Saudi Arabia a lot. Is it their general view, the, the authorities' view, that they have gotten away with it? I think the broad view is uh, that there's a price to be paid, that the reputation has been tarnished, that you can't wash this away. But uh, irrespective of that, that they will plow on on the track that they're on, that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman will continue to be uh, the Crown Prince. That's not going to change. The torture that we heard about for Tahi in the uh, Ritz-Carlton Hotel is not specific to him. We've heard about it happening to others who were in that hotel. Yeah. Five months ago and a day, Jamal Khashoggi was murdered. Nick Robertson, thanks very much. All right, top of the hour. Good morning, everyone. I'm Poppy Harlow. And I'm Jim Shudo. As we speak, 81 people, groups and offices tied to President Trump, are mulling how to respond to a brand new demand for information from the House Judiciary Committee, while the president, who is not on that list, responds as he often does this morning, he says that the Dems have, quote, gone stone cold crazy, obstructing justice, he says, by launching a big fat fishing expedition. Again, quoting there. Obstruction, obstructing justice, of course, believed to be a key point of investigation of the president in the special counsel probe, which the president never fails to attack. But now a former White House lawyer is airing some very different views about the investigation and of Robert Mueller himself. Ty Cobb tells ABC News in a new podcast he does not see the Mueller probe as a witch hunt. Our Phil Mattingly joins us on the Hill. That's really interesting in and of itself. Also really interesting are these 81 names on a list that could be growing. Phil? 
Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler making clear that this was only the first request for names. More could be coming in the days and weeks. But if you look at this initial request, you recognize that this effort by the Judiciary Committee, this effort by House Democrats, is neither limited nor is it subtle. It goes directly to the heart of the president's closest relationships and family members, like his sons Donald Jr. and Eric Trump, to some of his closest uh, Trump Organization confidants, Alan Weisselberg, the CFO, Rona Graff, his personal assistant and gatekeeper, former White House officials like Sean Spicer, Steve Bannon. If you broaden out the whole list of 81, it really kind of tracks into categories from the Trump Organization to the Trump campaign uh, to the White House, the current White House, and uh, entities involved with the Russia investigation that have been unearthed up to this point. And I think one of the big questions now is, okay, there are document requests. What comes next, particularly if some of these individuals don't cooperate? Well, Jerry Nadler was asked this question by Aaron Burnett last night. Will he consider subpoenas? This is what he said. For two years, the Trump administration has been attacking the, the core functions of our, of our democracy, and the Congress has refused to do any oversight. Uh, they've refused to, they, they've shielded him. They've acted more as shields than as what the Congress is supposed to do, which is to be a check and a balance. We are going to be the check and a balance. We are going to find out. We're going to lay out the facts for the American people. So it's worth noting that this is the first step. It's document requests. Subpoenas are very much a possibility. So are future hearings. It's going to be a lengthy, methodical process, but it's one that is very much still kicking into gear right now, guys. Phil, from the, the groups that have been requested and the individuals, can you, can you figure out uh, a focus, or, or really are they open to all lines of inquiry here, you know, business wrongdoing, political, et cetera? It's certainly a wide scope at this moment, but they've really kind of characterized it into to three or four particular issues. You have uh, the, the Russia collusion investigation. There are pieces of that. There's corruption. There are the hush money payments that people have been talking about now for the past couple of months. There's the obstruction case as they look into the firing of FBI Director James Comey. And there's also abuse of power issues. You're talking about emoluments. You're talking about greed and corruption. Those are the allegations that are being laid out. Those are the issues that they're going to be looking into, trying to collect evidence, trying to make the case publicly. We'll see where they end up going from here, guys. Right, if this is the beginning and how big this list is going to get. Phil, thanks very much on Capitol Hill for us. So when asked whether he will cooperate with an investigation, the president says, these are his words, he, quote, cooperates every time. As for the White House, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders, well, she called the House Judiciary investigation, quote, a disgraceful abuse fishing expedition into tired and false allegations. Yeah, fishing expedition, clearly a talking point. Former White House lawyer Ty Cobb, However, who served the president for a number of months, he has a very different take. Have a listen. I don't feel the same way about Mueller. I don't feel the investigation is a witch hunt. A lot of things, you know, distracted him from focusing on the president, from Manafort's, you know, decade-old issues to, you know, the Papadopoulos of the world and, you know, the Carter Pages of the world and the Roger Stones of the world. So it's not my view that, that it's a witch hunt. Caitlin Collins at the White House. Caitlin, so, so Ty Cobb uh, with a very different approach to this investigation than President Trump's current legal representation. Yeah, and Ty Cobb has been out of the White House for nearly a year now. And not only does he not agree that the Mueller investigation is a witch hunt, which not only the president, but also his allies have repeated oftentimes, he also disagrees with the president when the president says he believes Robert Mueller is highly conflicted to be the special counsel. Instead, Ty Cobb says Robert Mueller is someone he's known for decades. And when he thinks of him, he thinks of him as a war hero. I think Bob Mueller is an American hero. I think Bob Mueller is a guy that, um, you know, even though he came from an arguably privileged background, you know, has a backbone of steel. Uh, he walked into a firefight in Vietnam to pull out one of his injured colleagues and was appropriately honored for that. I've known him for 30 years as a prosecutor and a friend, and um, I, think the, I think the world of Bob Mueller. Now, two other things from this interview with Ty Cobb that stuck out. One, he said he disagrees with the approach that people like Rudy Giuliani and the other members of the president's legal team have taken because he believes they've undermined the public trust in the special counsel to conduct a fair investigation. And two, as we're all waiting for that report to come out, Ty Cobb said he believes it's going to be shorter rather than longer. And he does not think it's going to be the silver bullet that's going to take down the Trump presidency. And he does not think it's going to tie any kind of collusion between the Trump campaign and Russians.
Kaylin Collins at the White House, thanks very much. We're joined now by former presidential advisor David Gergen, advised a bunch of presidents, and former federal prosecutor Lee Wheel. Thanks to both of you. David, I want to ask you here just about the political implications of this, because you know a lot of those districts that swung from red to blue in the midterms were moderate Democrats, right? Uh, here you have a Democratic Party now controlling the House, taking a very aggressive investigative posture towards the president. Politically risky, in your view. I think there is a risk. I'm glad you asked the question. <clears throat> a lot depends, Jim, on, on what perspective you're looking at this from. Uh, there are some observers, like uh, David Leonard of the New York Times today wrote, in, in his opinion, that Nancy Pelosi had this investigation under good control, that she had the right b balance of, of zeal uh, with caution, that she was holding back, from, and the committees were holding back from talking about impeachment. They were going to do all these preliminary investigations first. That's one perspective, and I think a lot of Democrats will rally to that perspective. The other perspective is this looks like a free-for-all uh, coming just after the Mueller report does not, you know, by all accounts may not be as explosive as first thought, may not find collusion, and the Democrats are moving now to a broader set of investigations uh, that I think a lot of Republicans and maybe some independents are going to say it looks like piling on, uh, and, I, and they're overplaying their hand. My own view is right now that the Democrats may think that with his six committees, they've got this under control, but that they would be well advised to act, almost act like a Justice Department and, and issue some kind of statement to the country, to the people of the country, about what they're trying to do with these various investigations, mm -hmm. what the justifications are, and what the precedents are. There are precedents for what they're doing, uh, going back to Watergate, uh, that are important. But I think they need to periodically tell the American people, how does this all fit together, what? as opposed to looking like we're just in a war yeah. against these guys. Yeah. Well, to that point, David, we just had uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin on Democrat of Maryland, who's on oversight and judiciary, and he said the reasoning here, when, when I asked him essentially that, is he said there was no, there's been no oversight over the last two years from Republicans. That's him making that, that case to the American people. How would you most effectively approach it? I mean, I know you brought up Watergate. Are, are you saying something like a Watergate, a la Watergate-type investigative committee in a single sort of... Uh, entity would be well, the most effective? In the, in the Watergate, notably on the Senate side, uh, they, they, they combine committees in effect. They, make, they, they uh, organize a select committee that Sam Irvin, right. uh, the senator from North Carolina, uh, uh, ran. He was Democrat, and Howard Baker was his top ranking uh, Republican. And it was that committee that is worth remembering that its investigation turned out to be pivotal for the whole Watergate case. It was that committee that discovered there was a taping system in the White House. Uh, nobody knew that before. It hadn't come out in any special counsel report or anything like that. So these investigations do have but not only precedent, but they've been valuable. Mm -hmm. What I do think is that under all the circumstances and the fact we've had two years of investigations now of Donald Trump, that that the, the Democrats in the House, the country would be well served by some sort of statement that is updated periodically yeah. about how this all fits together. Yeah, you definitely sense some impatience. At least you got some experience yeah. here. To say the least, uh, you, you were a lawyer for the Democrats on the Judiciary Committee during the Clinton uh, impeachment proceedings. As you look at this now, of course, you were on the other side then, right? Uh, Republicans investigating a Democratic president here. What do you see as the dangers for Democrats? Well, and, and Jerry Nadler, of course, was on that committee as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was actually, you know, a, a Democrat on that committee. Uh, John Conyers was heading the Judiciary Committee at that point. So he has experience going through this. And, of course, he saw the, the political side of that, uh, which was that Clinton was impeached, President Clinton was impeached. But then, of course, um, his polls were, you know, never higher um, after that, sort of, a, you know, the Republicans. Uh, did not fare well with that, even though the president was impeached. So um, I think he, Nadler is looking at that probably and saying, look, you know, we need to have this investigation. But I think uh, the point is well taken that he should be issuing sort of reports out of the investigation, if you will, uh, saying, you know, here's what we're trying to do. But at the very beginning of an investigation, I think that it's very, it's got to be, uh, from a legal perspective, this is what you would do, have a very broad 
broad scope to it because what are you trying to do at any beginning of an investigation? You're trying to find the facts. You're in a fact-finding or discovery stage, and that's what you're doing with sending out 81 requests, and they are only requests now. There are only voluntary uh, requests. I, I, w I assume that they are going to turn into subpoenas. Why do I assume that? Because of the short turnaround time, only a two-week turnaround time. To me, that says, hey, we're giving you sort of a wink and a nod, knowing that you're not going to uh, respond in a, in a yes way, right? Because yeah. you're, you're not going to do that in two weeks. So that's mm -hmm. going to be a no. We're going to subpoena you and maybe even compel your testimony and see whether or not you take the fifth. Yeah. David, help us understand, because I think Lise is so smart to bring up Clinton's approval rating, right, that hit 73 percent a record high for him during these impeachment proceedings. Is this an apples to apples comparison when you look at the president currently, or is it an apples to oranges sort of look here? Meaning, should the Democrats look at that and learn something, or is this just different? I think Democrats should look at that and, and learn something. Uh, there, there is a parallel here, of course, and that is that Bill Clinton, they, they had impeachment proceedings against Bill Clinton because he was uh, charged basically with having sex with uh, in, in the Oval Office, uh, but then lying about it. And it, it, now we have a president who, on the hush money thing, uh, is accused of having sex and then paying people to hush up and to sort of a set in effect to, to lie about it. Uh, so there is that parallel. But I do think that after two years of, you know, of, of, of additional investigations, uh, Clinton was a much more sympathetic figure because it suddenly happened out of the blue and, it, you know, his, he was riding along and doing well as president. Uh, but with Trump, he's been mired in investigations since he got into office. So I think people are, I think the country now, wants to have and understand why are we going to do this. I, it, it may be very, very justified, but I just think they need to persuade the people and bring people along uh, and if they want to get a national sport for this and not have it right. turn into what happened give, to give Clinton. Some, right. Give some answers. Le least before we go, your thoughts. Yes, and also with the, the, the difference, too, is that Ken Starr, who was in the Clinton investigation, the independent counsel, he was able to present his case. Here, uh, we may never actually hear what Mueller's investigation produces because most of it may be redacted, which yeah. is why Jerry Nadler may be starting this investigation to begin with. Yeah, I, I remember when the Starr report yeah. came out, we were all reading it. This may be a very different circumstance. Exactly. And it, it's interesting, yeah. you know, right, the difference between an independent counsel and that statute expiring exactly. and, a, and, a, and a special counsel now. Thank exactly. you both. Lise, nice to have you. David Gergen, as always, thanks. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell concedes.